Um, this one's on. Yeah, right. it's it's is it not on? No. Yeah, we've been having a few issues with the back. <laughs> so anyway, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about uh, CPC and, and Duralpath. Um, and so you're now the topology ready. Sorry. Mm -hmm. What do you got to say about Ryan? Mm -hmm. I don't have cheat sheet for you guys. Mm -hmm. you Isabel? Isabel? Greg. Greg is okay, super. Thanks for being here. Um, so we're going to, this quote, everybody thinks they can be a dermatologist, you know, because you know, people don't die. Yeah, it's easy. Never lose a patient, and you know you never you don't have to be on call very much, and all this kind of stuff. So, but you really not everybody can do your office. It's really a lot harder. This quote: What's really the hardest thing of all is seeing what's right in front of you with your eyes. You know, that's and dermatology is morphology. Okay, you're entering a morphologic field. So, some of you guys may have been in cardiology or neurology or something like that. You're now in the world of morphology. That means looking at stuff, looking at forms, recognizing patterns. So it's a little different ball game. And for some people, they're used to like looking at uh, uh, you're dealing with uh, listening to heart sounds or doing physical exams. It's a different different deal. And sometimes it takes a while to kind of change that. So how do you get good at anything? Okay, this isn't necessarily for dermatology, but it's good for any playing a musical instrument, learning how to speak foreign language, anything like that. You have to have a good sound solid approach. I'll tell you a little bit about that today in this talk. You have to know the details, so you've got to spend some time with textbooks. You've got to spend time with, you know, you've got to know the stuff. So you've got to spend time learning the stuff that's in the books and reading journals. You've got to practice. You've got to practice a lot. You've got to see lots of patients, lots of slides. So you want to, this is your opportunity to practice as much as you can. It's called practice of medicine, but you've got to keep practicing your whole life. And so I strongly recommend that you practice as much as you can in your residency. And then you have to learn from mistakes. This is maybe of the four things, possibly the most important. You're in a safe environment. And uh, my wife has got this little thing at, at home that, that we display in our kitchen. It says, sing loud when you don't know the words. So if you make a mistake, you should be glad that you're making a mistake. Celebrate the fact that you're making a mistake. You, wanna, you want to make mistakes. You don't want to be timid in residency program. You want to be bold. Okay. So we're going to give you a little bit about the, the sort of approach this morning. We're talking about you know clinical pathologic correlation dermatopathology, and it's called dermatopathology for a reason because it's dermatology and pathology wedded together. And our number one test in dermatology is skin biopsy. So that's what separates you as a real dermatologist from a pseudo dermatologist. Maybe they have a little weekend course and they think they know skin disease, or maybe a PA or something. Just haven't really trained in dermatology. You'll be able to correlate clinical things with pathology. Okay, and that differs from a lot of other specialties in medicine. Interns almost never look at biopsies. You know, I mean I did an internal medicine internship years ago. We almost never went out and looked at the bloodstream or anything like that. So you, you have to really you know, correlate histology with, with what you see in the patient. Now, I like this approach. We can call it an algorithmic method for accurate diagnosis. I mean, what is an algorithm? Well, basically, it's a step-by-step -step procedure for coming up with some answer. And it comes mostly from mathematics, but it's very useful in, in clinical medicine. So you take one bit of information and another bit of information you keep adding until you finally come up with your diagnosis. And so in morphologic fields, pattern analysis is commonly used. Now why do we use pattern analysis? There's lots of different diseases. You look at those textbooks of dermatology, they're not thin, they're pretty thick. So there's a lot of stuff in there, and a lot of them have general things that make you look a lot alike. So if you see somebody with a viral exam from a drug eruption, they can look almost identical. Right. Okay. There's a lot of different pathology patterns also. If you look at dermatopathology textbooks, those are pretty thick books also. <clears throat> so they all have a lot of different overlapping findings. So you have to sort of have some a method for dealing with this stuff. Because they do tend to sort of segregate out in different themes and patterns. So the purpose is to try to categorize these themes and have a system that you can go through so you can put all these A, B, C, D, E bits of information together and come up with a diagnosis. Now, I like the, when I'm looking at a slide, and the fellows will tell you, we, we look at low power first. Okay, my old professor, Dr. Ackman, used to have this little statement that he would say, low power diagnosis, high power mind. Okay, so there's some truth to that. You don't want to just zoom in and look at a patient and go up to them like this, you want to start low and kind of gradually move forward. So same thing with, with the microscopic uh, page too. So Dr. Ackerman used to use this analogy also to kind of recognize the silhouette of something. 
and then you get a general sense. So if you ever go out bird watching, you don't have the bird in your hand to look at it close. You see these things flying or in a tree. So you kind of get a general sense for what kind of birds you're dealing with. And really when you're looking at it from 100 yards away, you don't really see all the details. You sort of see a little black silhouette image. And then you add additional information, and then you can actually get a more specific diagnosis of the bird, okay? So you can see a little white-throated sparrow. It's got a little crest on the top. It's different from the song sparrow. So you add these initial bits of information, ultimately identify, and you can use the same analysis. We do the same thing in, in pathology. It's, it's really no different. The first thing we do is sometimes we'll just take the slide and hold it up. If you're getting ready to take a board examination, like Gina just did, I would recommend that you do that. Seems stupid, and we're not holding up our slides here to look at a microscope very frequently, but sometimes we do. But if you're in a test situation, you'll say, hmm, what have I got here? You'll just look at it, maybe it's a big round ball, maybe it's a solid mass, maybe it's a tiny sliver. So some of those things can be helpful. <clears throat> Get a general sense for what the region might have looked like in the patient. Was it a nodule, a tumor, maybe a dermatitis? And I always examine the slide first without any information. Okay, because once you're given information, you're biased. The instant you somebody tells, unless you have a really bad short-term memory, you're going to be biased. <laughs> so always look at it first for that anyway. Then we look and decide which part of the body we're dealing with. There's certain conditions that affect some parts of the body and they don't affect other parts of the body. Like, for example, dyshydrotic dermatitis affects your palms and soles. You wouldn't diagnose dyshydrotic dermatitis as like space. They think you're an idiot. So you want to you know, look at so the parts of the body are important. You look at the type of biopsy that's performed, and is it adequate for our ability to assess it and make a diagnosis? Is it a punch, which we like for inflammatory conditions? Shave or saucerizations for neoplasms? Not so good for inflammatory diseases. Okay, so please, we have people that send us shaves. We had a biopsy today, shave biopsy just a few minutes ago, a granuloma annulary that barely got into papillary dermis. Well, granuloma annulary lives in the reticular dermis, so you can't make the diagnosis that way. Or if you have a shave of a paniculitis, unless you really, you know, you're not going to work. So you really need, those are good for, for neoplasms. And then if you have a large neoplasm, you might want to do an incisional biopsy, where you kind of cut out a piece of pie type of thing, or an excision. If you think it's a melanoma, you might want to just excise it right there in the clinic. Um, so those are the general kind of techniques that we do. Now the first thing we do is we sort of decide generally is we think it's an inflammatory process like psoriasis or like a planus or one of those, or do we think it's a neoplastic process? So we kind of segregate those out. That's generally true. There's some things that don't fit perfectly into those categories, but generally that works really well and I want to, I like to keep it simple. Okay. So how do you tell that apart? Well sometimes it's not so simple. But a neoplasm always has some type of cells that don't belong there normally. So we say they're neoplastic cells. You say, well, that sort of sounds tautologic, uh, but it's true. The, the neoplasm will always have some abnormality of cells that either live there that are abnormal or that shouldn't be there in the first place. Inflammatory condition is going to be comprised of inflammatory cells. And you can have both. You can get inflammatory uh, host responses in neoplasms. That happens a lot. Um, and then you can get, uh, you know, neoplasms of inflammatory cells, like lymphoma, for example. So there, there are little exceptions to the rule. And there are some things that really don't fit into any of the categories, like say a deposition or a tattoo, something like that. But generally, you can get them in the, in the categories for inflammatory neoplasm. So we're going to ask you those questions when we look at unknown slides, which of those people it is. Neoplasms generally, the cells are arranged in aggregations or nests, or if they're diffuse, uh, aggregations of epithelial or mesenchymal cells, whereas inflammatory processes are comprised of primarily inflammatory cells, neutrophils, histocytes, mast cells. And they tend to uh, sort of segregate into nine prime, uh, patterns. And we'll talk about those too. So let's say we're going to move to first and well, we think it's going to be an inflammatory process. Now we're going to look at these various patterns here. I'm going to go through them. I might spend a lot of time with these because you're going to hear these over and over and over again. And by the time you're Gina's age, you'll know these in your sleep. So you know, I'm going to say age, I mean <laughs> residency wise. Or then graduate. She's very young. <laughs> So these are the nine basic inflammatory patterns, and then we look and see which type of inflammatory cell is in there, and then these are them right here. So we'll just kind of go through those. The first one is supersuppurated acid dermatitis, and so that you see why you need a punch biopsy because you want to be able to assess whether the lower blood vessels are involved also. So if you don't have that, you can't say. You can just say it's superficial, but that's all we have. So that's where the, and then also notice whether or not there's epidermal change uh, involved here. 
So here's an example, low power. You can see it just shows really a very sparse infiltrate around those blood vessels with no real epidermal change in it. Here's the clinical, it happens to be a drug reaction in this case, so that's a fairly common cause of superficial paradigm for dermatitis. And then we ask ourselves what about the epidermal change that's associated with it, if there is any. And there are three main types of epidermal changes that we see. Interface change, spongiosis, and then sore and astral hyperplasia, which can be either regular or irregular. Regular means the epidermal reaches are all the same size, pretty close to the same size. Uh, irregular, they vary, they look different sizes. There are some others. And these are some other things. Again, I'm not going to go through all these, but this shows you why you have to spend some time with textbooks, because you're going to learn all these eventually, but um, there are a lot of different changes that can happen in the epidermis. So interface dermatitis, this refers to inflammation at the dermal junction. That's the interface from the epidermis to the dermis. And the two types, there's vacuolar, where there are little holes there, and there also is lichen, where you get a dense band-like infiltrate of cells that looks similar to lichen planus, and that's why we call it lichenoid. It looks like lichen planus. This is vacuolar, and you can see those little holes, the basal cell layer right there, and this is lichen. It's like lichen planus, which you'll learn a lot more about in time, and here's what the clinical is of the lichen planus. Spongiotic dermatitis, superficial paradise dermatitis with spongiosis. Again, spongiosis refers to a collection of fluid between the keratinocytes, looking like a sponge under the microscope. And the most common cause of this is one of the so-called spongiotic dermatitis. Eczema, people call those in general, this is allergic contact dermatitis. Psoriastral hyperplasia, again, we just talked about that, and here you see an example of quite regular psoriastral hyperplasia. This would be very characteristic, say, for psoriasis. And here you see an example of psoriasis. Notice how regular that psoriasis form hyperplasia of the epidermis is. Next is superficial and deep. We involve both the superficial blood vessels and the deep uh, blood vessels. Okay, and it may or may not have epidermal changes associated with that. This is discoid leukocerebellitosis, one of the fairly common causes of superficial and deep infiltrates. Nodular and diffuse, where those uh, cells are not only around the blood vessels, they're, no, they're now kind of beginning to spread and connect with one another, forming small nodular aggregates in the dermis, or sometimes diffuse, where the whole dermis is involved in inflammation. And this is an example of a nodular dermatitis with histiocytes. This is sarcoidosis here. And this is an example of a dense diffuse dermatitis, Sweet's syndrome, Sweet's disease, which all of these cells are used to this. Vasculitis is one of the nine patterns. And there are several different classification schemes of vasculitis. We're not going to talk about all those today. But the histologic definition of fully developed vasculitis is where there's fibrin or thrombosis uh, within the walls of blood vessels. And here's leukocytoclastic vasculitis, classic form that we see. It's probably one of the most common that we see. It gives you a lot of different uh, clinical lesions, macules, papules, pap uh, plaques, pustules even. The next one is intraepidermal vesicular and pustular dermatitis. So this is a blister that occurs in, within the epidermis. Okay. And uh, there, these are the main ways that you can get blistering in the epidermis, spongiosis we talked about, ballooning degeneration, that's where the cells fill with fluid and sort of pop, uh, acanthalysis, the cells fall apart, the spines that hold them together this is dissolve, that's why it's called acanth, because acanth is the Greek word for spine, and then we have epidermal hyperkeratosis and then shearing, those are some other causes. And this is a little cartoon diagram showing those various uh, processes, and herpes virus infection is one of the more common causes of intraepidermal ballooning vesicular dermatitis. You see the multinucleated giant cells there with the balloon degeneration, and also acanthalysis. So herpes has two types of processes causing blistering. Then we have subepidermal blisters <clears throat> beneath the epidermis. So bullous pentaboid, common cause of that, and you know, bullous disease that you'll learn a lot about uh, over the course of time. Fibrosing and sclerosing disorders, things like morphia, nephrogenic Systemic fibrosis, those are things that are associated with fibrosis. Fibrosis is associated with an increase in collagen and fibroblasts. Sclerosis is a decrease in fibroblasts with homogenization of the collagen. Levels. So two different patterns, but same general inflammatory pattern. So here's morphia, example of that. Folliculitis and perifolliculitis, so the inflammation is around the follicles, either in or around the uh, hair follicles. And uh, here's some examples of those, obviously the acne, disorders, rosacea, lupus, lichen planifimeris, here's, here's tinea capitis, that's a folliculitis associated with alopecia. And then paniculitis, it's where we have inflammation of fat, and there are two main types of that. There's the so-called lobular paniculitis, and then there's sepal paniculitis. You can learn a lot more about those two, and you can get those with or without vasculitis. 
in this is erythematodosum, which is probably one of the more common forms of paniculitis that we see clinically. So it's really got a fast trigger on it. Um, the next thing you do after you get into the pattern, you've identified whether there's epidermal change or not, look at the type of cell that's involved, composition of the infiltrate. And different diseases tend to have different types of inflammatory cells associated with plasma cells, commonly seen in morphine, syphilis, as you're well aware, eosinophils, bullous pentaboid. So that's kind of the general way that you kind of go through this. You categorize stuff, look at the epidermal changes, look at what cell types are involved. So go through a systematic algorithm. Now, if you're ever up here reading slides with us, you may say, how can Dr. Cocker make that diagnosis in one millisecond? Well, I've probably done this millions of times, okay? So when you do it really a lot, you get fast at it. But if you're starting out, you want to go slow. Be systematic. Don't try to be, you know, like Michael Jordan, you know, don't be like Mike. You don't want to do it. Go slow and steady. Work through it. Formulate a differential diagnosis. Short list. And if you're doing the grand rounds, I kind of want you to be a long list, unless sort of an academic exercise. But when you're really making a diagnosis, the shorter the list, the better. The best list is one diagnosis. One is best. If you have to have a couple of three, that's okay, but keep it, keep it low. And then we want to do clinical correlation and additional studies if we need to. So that's the inflammatory side. Let's move over to the neoplastic side. And so first thing is we say you decide if it's neoplastic or not, we want to ask ourselves if it's benign or malignant. Okay, that's pretty important. You know, malignant, not good, but I, you're happy if you have that. Well, how do we do that? Well, generally at low power, there are certain things that we look at as well. Um, benign sort of has the four S's, if you will. They tend to be small, symmetrical, well circumscribed, and superficial as a general rule. And again, these are general rules. You can have lipomas that are the size of basketballs that are totally benign. So you can get large, deep lesions that are still benign, but in general, in skin lesions, these four things tend to work. And then the opposite is true if it's malignant. It can be large, asymmetrical, poorly circumscribed, more deeply situated, so bottom heavy as opposed to top heavy. Other things that help, uh, again, wedge shape, there's maturation relative to the few mitotic figures, no pleomorphism, those general things. But there are exceptions to these, but generally, these things tend to work. So we're going to, you know, we're going to ask you, as a general rule, and I expect you to know about all these exceptions, at least early on. So, these are some examples, low power diagnoses of benign lesions, and nevus on the right, a severe keratosis there, a sebaceous hyperplasia there, and benign neural lesion of schwannoma there. So again, notice these are all relatively small, symmetrical, well circumscribed. They behave in those four general patterns of low power. Now, malignant lesions, again, they can start small and get bigger, like this actinic keratosis ended up as this deep squamous cell carcinoma. So these things have chronologic uh, elements to them, and we'll talk a little bit about them later on. Basal cell carcinoma, again, doesn't tend to metastasize, but it's malignant because it's very locally infiltrated, like those cases we saw last night at the conference. They're pretty nasty. Melanocytic lesions, we always talk about ABCDs of melanoma, where the ABCDs apply to the microscope. So they tend to be, uh, melanoma is asymmetrical, broad, color variability, diameter variability, six millimeters, uh, border irregular. So those, those features are all seen in, in, uh, in melanoma. This is a melanoma under the microscope right there. But the next thing we do is we decide whether it's epithelial or not epithelial. Okay, so what, how do you do that? Well, cells that are epithelial, they tend to be, uh, the cells are more polyhedral or round. They're usually not spindle, not always, but usually not. They tend to have abundant cytoplasm with distinct cell borders. They tend to be very closely opposed to one another. And it's just the opposite is true when you're doing not epithelial. More spindle, less cytoplasm, indistinct borders, mucinous stroma. So those things kind of generally help you to decide between those. So here's squamous epithelial differentiation, and you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, that's normal skin. So that's basically a, a cancer that is differentiated towards the squamous epithelium of your outer portion of your skin. And basal cells differentiate more towards the more primitive germinative cells, like the follicle or the mantle zone of the hair follicle. And then not epithelial You get spindle cell morphology. These are some biopsies of neural neoplasms, so again, they, are, they basically will have a useless, looser stroma to them many of the time. So these are things that kind of help you when you're looking whether it's epithelial or not epithelial. And interesting enough, melanocytic is a type of epithelium. It's neural epidermal. So that's, when you say, if you want to be purist, it's actually a type of epithelial differentiation. So then we, after we got down to that category, so what's the specific answer at that point? So these are the types of epithelial differentiation. Again, we talked about squamous and basal, there are others. And then some of the non-epithelial. You think it's, you know, think about what things live in the skin. Fibroblasts live there, nerves live there, blood vessels, etc., and then the bone marrow derived elements. So you kind of go through that systematically as well, and you come up with a diagnosis 
the vast majority of the time. So that's the microscope. Now let's move over to the clinic, okay, because it is dermatopathology. We're going to talk now about clinical diagnosis. So this is clinico-pathologic correlation. So just like we use under the microscope, we use an algorithmic method for accurate clinical diagnosis. And I would recommend also that you go slow here too. You know, if you see somebody like uh, oh, Dr. Yancey walks in the room, you may be able to make a diagnosis like that because he's been doing it for 25, 30 years, okay? But you have it. You've been doing it for 25, 30 days. So you need to go slow. And you need to have an algorithmic approach here too. Start at low magnification here, just like with the slide. Move progressively closer. Don't just walk up and grab their hands and look at it. You know, start slow, go from a distance, and move forward. Because all these things can give you information as you add it together to come up with a, an accurate diagnosis and synthesize. The differential diagnosis can relatively short and then synthesize. And one thing that you need to do that, again, non dermatologists can't do is picture in your mind what are the pathologies going to be. So you know what it looks like under the microscope because you've learned. You say, well, what do I think this is going to look like before I take the bias? And how do I put that together to come up with a final diagnosis? So the first step, look at the patient from afar. What do they look like in general? Race, sex, age, general health. What's the distribution of their skin eruption? Do they have just localized lesions? Do they have widespread lesions? This guy, he's got something wrong with him, doesn't he? So if he has a skin eruption, where do you think it might be? Maybe it is pretibular. He's obviously got a scar from his <coughs> thyroid problem. He's got exophthalmos. He's got pretibular myxedema. This guy pictures worth a thousand words. Also, do you think he feels very good? No. He's got a drug reaction. An old guy, not in very good health, taking a lot of medications, got an urinary allergic eruption due to the medication. Distribution. Is it a solitary lesion? Are they combined to a specific area? Are they have like stereotypical distribution? The portal far right is an example of a photo exacerbated eruption. So under the eyes, the knee, the neck, the back of the hands. This is a very classic distribution. It's in the elbow area for rheumatoid nausea. You get rheumatoid nausea in every part of the body, but there's certain diseases that like the elbow. So it's a specific location that's kind of that you start thinking about this. Photo distribution. And also look at her. She doesn't look very healthy, does she? Cushing oil. That says everything. She feels bad. She's got lupus, QLE, young woman. So that picture would be on a board exam. You learn a whole lot from a photograph like that. And another example of the very stereotypical location. Now, the pretibular myxedema is in the pretibular areas. This is another disease that likes the pretibular areas. Different morphology, it's kind of got this sort of rippled zebra like pattern. This is macular amyloidosis, like amyloidosis. You also can decide whether the lesions are widespread, they can be unilateral, bilateral, symmetrical, asymmetrical, long lines of skin cleavings that can be universal, the entire body can be involved. This is a classic example of paralysis rosea, the skin cleavage lines involved there. And this is a form of ichthyosis. So this is pretty widespread but not universal involvement. And this guy here has got the lymphodermic psoriasis. Every part of his body is involved. Head to toe, side to side, everything's involved. Those are all widespread distributions. And the next step is you want to sort of evaluate the, the individual lesions and the way they kind of segregate with respect to one another. And, in dermatologic symptoms, you take on all these very interesting, uh, what we call configurations. They can be linear, they can be arciform, they can be circular, like small drops, like gut tape, or they can be like coins, like numular dermatitis. They can be grouped together closely, like herpes, or they can be sort of like a flock of sheep, we call that agmenated, corymbiform, maniliform, beaded. So these are all very interesting, beautiful things that you see in dermatology that you don't see in a lot of other specimens. This little kid's got lots of flat warts. Notice that he's got a linear streak of those in his face where it's sort of kebnerized. He's also got some crimp forming, a little central mother lesion with the daughter surrounding it. This individual's got a, a annular arciform eruption. This has got central clearing and the advancing border, so this is tinea. And this guy, allergic contact dermatitis. Notice that it's not following the normal skin lines, like lines of blasto. This is, is disobeying all uh, embryologic skin cleavage lines here, this is allergic contact dermatitis, and that's where the leaf runs across, and so you can poison ivy. Now the next step, and I'm not going to go through this because it's sort of boring and long, so, but you need to know this, the fundamental lesions of the skin, these are the building blocks, the macules, papules, nodules, tumors, all those kind of things, so I'm not going to show you pictures of all these because they're in every single textbook of dermatology, but you need to know this like the back of your hand, okay, you, you cannot be a dermatologist this is like knowing the ABCs, like speaking a language. You have to know 
these words and you have to know what they mean. So you're going to be asked at conferences. So it's the fundamental, let's say primary allegiance. I like to say fundamental allegiance, like the building blocks, like Legos, you know, but you can basically, primary is okay too. Everything in the skin is really secondary to something. So if you call them primary allegiance, that's fine, but know that they're basically fundamental allegiance. Now, something else that y'all learn a lot about is, is this chronology in dermatology. Because every single disease has got early, fully developed, and late stages to them, just like people do. When you're born, you get to go through the teenage years, you become an adult, you get old like me, and then you eventually die. So diseases do the same thing. And depending on when you see these diseases, they're going to look different. So if you see somebody that has erythema forming on day one, it may look like a viral exam. You see it on day five, they may be widespread blisters all over their body. So it's very important. And again, probably everything in the skin starts off with a teensy tiny dot if you get it early enough, like a little tiny macule. And if that goes on, it can turn into a patch or it can turn into a papule, and then papules can coalesce and form plaques, so they get really bigger, more nodules and tumors. Um, they can blisters can form in the skin, they can end up as bully. So again, this is all chronologic, and depending on when you see the patient, things may look different. So this guy's got urticaria, and if you look carefully, some of those areas are little teensy tiny dots, and they coalesce to these very large plaques giant or pair of wheels. This guy started out with this sort of gunmetal gray macular eruption, and this is what it looked like when we saw him initially. As time went on, like about a week later, this is him at the autopsy where he died. He had calcium phylaxis, he had widespread infarction of large parts of his skin and also of his heart and all sorts of things happen there, so it's a bad disease. The other thing that you need to be able to do is look at the morphologic uh, Lesions a little more carefully. You want to decide whether, say, anexal structures are involved or not. The size and shape of lesions, the color. Uh, you will feel lesions. So that's one thing that's you're never going to be replaced by just looking at pictures because you actually need to see the patient in the office and feel the lesion and see what it's like. Uh, this is sort of analogous to looking at the slide at higher magnification. So again, this is uh, you find whether the, let's say a patio, for example, is it follicular or non follicular? What's its color? What does it look like on the end, etc. Uh, so the follicles destroyed. This guy's got lichen planus, lichen planus pilaris, and so this is wiped out. Their hair follicles. This hair is gone. I'm coming back. Scarring alopecia. This guy's got a lymphoma. The lymphomas don't like to pay attention to follicles and other structures. It's just totally wiped out his eyebrows and some of his uh, mustache area there. So that's very important. A benign pseudo lymphoma would not do that. It would leave the hair follicles intact. So things like that can be very helpful in making the diagnosis. You want to look at the size and shape of the individual lesions. It's also very important, especially when you're dealing with the neoplasm. Melanoma, for example, we use those A, B, C, D, E features. This is lichen planus. It's got the very characteristic uh, flat-topped pink polygonal papules with the white scale, the width is three on the surface of that. So that's a classic description for lichen planus. And the shape of those lesions is very important. This is wing melanoma. So if you don't think this is melanoma, you're a dangerous doctor. It's an obvious melanoma. It's got all the ABCB features of, of melanoma, so that's, you have to know that. And color is also very important. And this is something where non dermatologists they don't get any of this stuff. They, they just think something red or black or white. But if you're a dermatologist, it's sort of like being a gourmet. You really have to be able to describe the color of these things in more of a sort of thoughtful fashion. Hues, tones, why is the color here? So there's a, we think about something that's white. There's a lot of different types of white. You can have total alabaster white, like in vitiligo, where there's zero melanocytes, or you get kind of an off-white, creamy white. If say somebody faints, you know the blood goes out of their skin, but they don't have lost any melanin, so they're not totally ash dead white. You get your white because of scale, or also because of sclerosis. This is vitiligo. There's zero melanocytes here. Look how white that skin is. This is lichen sclerosis anthropophis. It's also white. But it's not as white as vitiligo. It's kind of a creamy color white, a little slightly yellowish to it. And that's because of papillary dermis. It's got sclerosis in it. That's why it develops that color. It's got melanocytes here, normal number. Same thing with red. You need a bright, brilliant red. Nobody's wearing anything red this morning, so we'll have to do a little cut there. That's a, a bright red. Um, or you can get purple, a deeper red, all caused by dilated blood vessels and red blood cells. You get things like tattoo pigment cinnabar. This is a kid with a hemangioma. Notice that's kind of almost got a port wine color to it. This individual's got an acute inflammatory disease. I think this was lupus erythematosus. And notice how bright that is. It's the 
because of extravasating red cells and also the fetal gauge formation. Different color red. This is a beautiful photograph because it shows several things here all at once. It shows an orange color, orangish red, and then that little red hemangioma is filled with blood. So the orange color with those follicular spines is very characteristic of Pterorhizus rupilaris, which we'll know more about. And then the hemangioma, you can see the difference in color between those two. It's a nice contrast there. So there's two different types of red, orange and bright red. Same thing with blacks, browns, blues. The darkest pigment in our body is melanin. You take melanin and lift it higher up, put it in the cornified layer, it gets jet black. If you move it down, it starts getting brown. If you move down even further, it starts looking blue. The same material, just depending on where it is in the skin, it has a different color to it. So this guy on the left used to look like his daughter. He started using silver-containing eye drops, and he turned got Argeria, and his skin got really jet black as a consequence of the silver deposit. This is a little girl that's got neurofibromatosis, and so it's, this is melanin, but it's, it's got this cafe au lait, this light brown color to it. And so it's also induced by melanin. And this guy has a carbon tattoo. He was a, a fireworks blow up in his face. So the black here is getting the carbon from the outside. It's not even being melanin in that case. Now, you need to also feel patients when they come to the clinic. You need to feel these things. Are these lesions rough? Are they smooth? Are they round? Are they flat top? cool, warm, etc. This guy's got psoriasis. You can imagine what this is going to feel like when you rub your hand on it. It's going to feel crusty, rough. This person's got sciatosis on a multiplex. It's going to be a very smooth surface. They're going to be rubbery beneath the skin, blotto. So you want to also, is it soft, hard? Is it these things pulsatile, perhaps? Are they loose or taut? These are neurofibromas. They're going to feel rubbery when you rub through and kind of squeeze these. This lady had metastatic recurrent breast cancer. And if you just see this looking at a picture, it could be 20 things. But if you, you see the surgical scar and you feel this, it felt like a rock, extremely hard. And so that's the value of being able to feel something like this in the clinic, because that would tell you the difference between, say, like some diffuse erythema, maybe from some dilated blood vessels, <coughs> cause that lesion. And then there are certain ancillary tests we do. We, again, the most common test in dermatology is skin biopsy, but there are other things we do. We rub lesions, area a sign, we may scope them to see if they're prolographism, if we think they're. Uh, maybe a granulomous inflammation, they take a glass slide and press on it, call it dioscopy. Sometimes if there's a blister, we'll see if we can cause it to spread by pressing on it, like the Mikulski sign or the Asbo Hansen sign. This is urticary pigmentosa before rubbing, and then here's a few seconds after rubbing. It goes to squeal and flare reaction there. So that's called the Darien sign. You can talk more about that too. And then the last thing that you do is kind of picture in your mind what you think the pathology is going to be under the microscope. And this is sort of what separates you from non-dermatologists. They, they, they can't do this. So put everything together. Come up with a short list of differential diagnostic possibilities. And then we maybe do confirmatory tests if we need to, doing a biopsy, et cetera. So these are all things you can do to sort of come up with a diagnosis. So Here's an example. This is a three-week-old girl that came with a scaly erythematous eruption on her trunk and extremities, and irritable, small for dates, and a widespread eruption of these crusted papules at some that followed the lines of blashco that you'll learn more about. And the diagnosis they thought clinically was epidemic hyperkeratosis. They didn't skin biopsy. So here's a little kiddo. And notice, as opposed to poison ivy, that the lines sort of went north-south. These lines are following the embryology neurologic cleavage lines in the patient. So that's important. That's often seen in genodermatosis and things of that nature. And then here's the biopsy. It showed a spongiotic dermatitis. Again, it had a lot of the acidophils in it. So it's a spongiotic therm, superficial cardiovascular dermatitis with spongiosis with the acidophils. And also, this one had uh, individual necrotic keratinocytes in the epidermis. So when we put all this together on the microscope, we know what the answer is. Trova knows what it is, of course, and continuation did many. We even now know what the gene is that causes this. Nemo. Nemo. Finding Nemo, right? So that's the diagnosis. Now, what do we do in the laboratory? We don't get to see patients. I wish we did, and we get a lot more clinical photos that are being sent to us. I love seeing patients. I'm a dermatologist first. I'm, I'm a pathologist second. I'm a dermatologist second. And I think the best dermatologists are those who are trained in dermatology. I'm biased. But uh, anyway, not, nothing against guys that are training pat first, but I love seeing patients. I love seeing pictures. So, but most of the time we don't get that. We just get a biopsy that's some, unfortunately got very little information on that you know, slip. <laughs> so we always look at it first without any information, like I said before. Then after we've looked at it on the microscope, then we look at the information. We like to correlate with clinical information, and then if 
we need to induce an additional study. So here's an example of a shaved biopsy. You can see that it's got all these holes in the outer part of the epidermis. It's got a lot of inflammation here, so it's a dense, diffuse inflammatory infiltrate. And as you go to higher magnification, you see that these individual keratinocytes are filled with liquid. We call that ballooning, right? Remember that? And then we also got this really dense diffuse infiltrate. It's got a lot of neutrophils in here. Here's the ballooning generation. You see these little tiny pink structures inside the keratinocytes. Those are uh, actual inclusion bodies from a virus in this case. So we would formulate a differential diagnosis based on that because we know what kind of diseases cause this. And here's that infiltrate with some lymphocytes, neutrophils, plasma cell bits, some dilated blood vessels here. And then after we sort of come up with a differential diagnosis, we look at the information and we see this. 25-year-old sheep herder from Central Texas. He came with this boggy red plaque on his hand for a week. Clinical diagnosis was pyelogangrenosa or gross sweets disease or anthrax. Well, we know the answer based on that. Don't we? Or, or, or this is what it looked like. You guys, you guys may not have heard of ORF, but you will, I promise you. It's a type of parapox virus infection. You see, when Gina was in your stage, she hadn't heard of it either. She came from the Ukraine. They'd never even heard of ORF over there, right? They do have sheep. You have sheep? Yeah. Okay. So they, they did but if they were dealing with cattle, it would have been milkers not. But they were dealing with monkeys, it could have been monkeypox, or gabapox, or panapox, or one of those things. So, so if you're going to master anything, you've got to have a good approach, learn the details, do not pitch you, go slow, take your time, systematic, step by step. And when you're in a great situation here, you're in a residency program, you got lots of great things that you're going to learn. And uh, what time is it? Is that time for the other talk? Yeah, I'll, I'll give this other talk since she... This is short, five minutes, ten minutes long. This is Inspiration Month. Inspiration Month. So you heard Dr. Cohen talk last week, you heard Dr. Cruz tomorrow. So I'll give you my little inspiration month. And I actually have a little bit that far in January. So welcome to Dermatology. Some of you guys have been around for a while, so we'll welcome you again. But for you new guys, you're in the best specialty in the world. So Jack just told you this. This is great. I think if you just remember this little slide, I would strongly recommend to, to follow that. I mean, that's really very good. And I, I, Jack is a great guy. He's been in practice a long time. He's really a dedicated dermatologist. So everything he said in that talk, um, I agree with. So this is an excellent little list of things to remember. So you've got a residency program here. It's the hardest one to get into in the world. Um, so you made it in. So you, it's like getting to Harvard. Okay, so what are you going to do now that you're here? Uh, well, I, I like this quote from this movie. I, I'm a movie guy, so I like movies. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's called Being There. Uh, and it's Peter Sellers. He sort of doesn't know what he can't do. He sort of just keeps, he eventually gets to be president of the United States. And he's got the IQ of probably about a five-year-old. Uh, but it's a really good movie. And I, I would encourage that you, you uh, watch that movie. You're coming in with a beginner's mind. You've got a clean white slate, tabula rasa, and then recommend that you kind of keep that throughout your training. You know, don't get a closed mind. You want to keep an open mind as you learn this stuff. So I like that little quote. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are a few. And there's good news and bad news about that. So you're going to not know how to make a difference if I go small yet. But you don't want to become so closed-minded that you forget stuff either. You always want to be open to the possibility that maybe something could be something else. So you want to keep a fresh perspective. You know, there's no inherent significance in anything. Sort of what happened versus what you mean. And just like Jack said, you always want to be in awe and grateful, and you always want to never get arrogant. I, I totally agree with that. This is an important little thing to remember also. So uh, a lot of people sort of define themselves and what they have. It doesn't really equate to success or happiness. You want to produce maximum value. What you stand for, actions are consistent with that, and the results that you're going to accomplish. So, Apply this sort of little thing to your, your residency program. I'm not going to ask you to declare what your life vision is today, but keep this in mind. You know, why, why are you here? Why are you a doctor? I'm giving a talk uh, tomorrow in Boston on burnout, and 50% of dermatologists are burned out now. 50%, which I was blown away by. We used to be 5%, 10%. Today, 50%. And so we don't want you to get there. We want you to stay happy. Don't get burned out. Um, 
Experience. Experience counts. You're the Malcolm Gladwell rule, 10,000 hours. You only get one dermatology residency. That's it, unless you want to take another dermatology residency somewhere else, which would be fun, you know, but I would make the most out of this residency, okay? Um, you need to approach this residency, I say, with a ravenous hunger. You need to be starving to see the next patient. You need to be starving to come up here and look at slide. You need to be doing everything you can. See as many patients. Look at the many slides. Go to as many conferences. You want to write a dermatology encyclopedia in your brain by the time you're through. So, like, Dr. Kova has got a pretty nice encyclopedia in her brain. And uh, you want to make lots of mistakes when you're in residency. It's safe. When you get out of the real world and make a mistake, there are lawyers around. You're like vultures. <laughs> but in residency, you're safe. It's a safe place to make mistakes. So, you want to make them. You want to celebrate them. Don't worry about it being perfect. Okay? You're excellent. You wouldn't be excellent. It would not be excellent if you didn't get a derm. You have to be excellent to get a derm. By definition, you wouldn't have made it here. So just remember that. And I like this little quote that came from that same book I talked about before. This guy says, you gave me this calendar all these little things I'm supposed to do, and it's only January and I've already screwed up. <laughs> so don't beat yourself up. You want to be your own friend, your you know, best friend, not your own friend. Yeah, gosh, I'll give you a comment. So if you could only ask one question, what would it be? Well, I don't know. There's probably a lot. How can I contribute all the time? So that's one thing I, a question I like to ask is, is what's next? Where do you want to be? 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You should do that exercise periodically with yourself. You know? Gina has to do that. I've got to do it. Branch, everybody's good. So you're going to ask where you want to be in 10 years. Very important. And then I like to sort of what was is more important than what is. The game's over, right? You're playing football, you know, say, hey, what was that little good play there? Let's just celebrate that play, but let's not run the next play. No, you have to be ready to run the next play. So the same thing is true in this situation also. You need to be thinking about what's next. The beginning is in sight. You're just the beginning of your, your training. Um, there's always gloom and doom naysayers. Mm -hmm. If you want to turn on uh, Fox News or Rush Limbaugh and listen to negative stuff all day long from morning till night, it's available to you. You do that. Or you can tune it over and listen to the symphony, or you know, listen to the comedy channel, or whatever. But you, I've lived my entire life under the risk of lawsuits, and I'll practice all this, all this kind of junk, and all this kind of stuff. Don't dwell on that. Yeah, it's there, but think about the great stuff. Focus on the good stuff. That leads to burnout. So forget about that. You got to move ahead, or you're never going to progress. I'm a movie guy, also. I love movies. Um, go watch a movie. I love Pat. <laughs> my wife says that that's my favorite movie. Maybe it is. I've probably seen it a thousand times, possibly. Um, but his message is always progress, always keep moving forward, not move backwards. Don't give up real estate. I don't like to think real estate twice, he said. And he may. You probably never even heard of that movie, but I recommend that you look at that too. She's got a very good message in that movie that life is a bank for the most poor suckers are starving to death. You know, there's some guys, if you, if you give them a treasure chest or a big a pile of treasure. Some people go in with an espresso spoon. You know, they dip at it and take little tiny bits of it. And other guys go by the biggest steam shovel they can get and they take as much as they can. So you have the opportunity to take advantage of your residency in the same way. Don't get a teaspoon, you know, get a big spoon. You know, go after it. I like this one too, Chariots of Fire. And that is a great movie. If you haven't seen that, it won about 20 Academy Awards. It's about the triumph of the human spirit. Babette's piece is all about selfless service. Recommend that you see that if you want to give us a movie that sort of teaches you about serving people, because we're servants as physicians. You know, our goal is to serve our patients first. That's our main goal in ourselves, but we want to serve our public, our patients, our community. And then MASH, okay, it's kind of an R-rated movie. It's got a lot of interesting stuff in there, but it's all about working hard <laughs> and playing hard. Okay, so they're having a great time in there and joking around, but they're saving lives. You know? so you kind of want to do something. I'm also a quotes guy. I love quotes. Again, this one, you know, that man at his best like water serves as he goes along. We kind of have an obligation to leave dermatology better than we came into it. A lot of guys don't have that attitude, but, but I do. I can put that in the, the way to do is to be. We talked about that be, do, have. So your attitude is important. Not what you do so much, it's your attitude. Why you do something. We just had a, a little talk the other day. We talked about why is more important. Um, then how and what. Uh, you got to have vision. Where there's no vision, people perish. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. I like this one from Kennedy. 
You know, we choose to go to the moon to do the other things because they're easy. Not because they're easy, but because they're hard. We like to take on challenges. Okay? And I like to do that too. And I like this one too. You see things and you say, why? I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? And George Bernard Shaw. So this is kind of from Jack a little bit too. You know, your practice is going to conform to your interests. You need to be a leader in something. So start thinking about that now. What do you want to be in dermatology? Okay, and, and you can, you know, it's just like uh, Mother Teresa said, I want to help the world. I want to do such a thing. What can I do to help the world? Mother Teresa says, go home and love your family. <laughs> so you can be a leader by just taking care of your practice, your community, your patients, your, you know, that, that's being a leader too. But you might say, hey, I want to be a specialist in uh, hair disease. I want to be, you know, interested in dramatophology. I want to be a Moser. So think about the niche you want to carve, the history you want to leave, the legacy that you want to have. You want to pace yourself. This is a marathon, not a spread like Dr. Cohen said the other day. You want to have other interests too, so I don't think you need to worry as much about that dermatology as perhaps if you were a surgeon, everyone will call it a doctor. <laughs> but still, um, you do not want to get burned out. That's important. You always want to be ethical. You want to be led by your vision and your mission in life. If, you, if you're led by fear, greed, and monetary gain, I promise you, you will get burned out. <coughs> It'll happen, no question. Um, so this quote that, from this guy Simon Sinek, we just talked about him, is to start with why, People do business with people not because of because of why they do the business, not because of what the business does. So you're that's your why, why you are in this field, which you're all about. And our goal is to do business with people who believe in what we believe in. So you have to, like Jack said, you've got to strive to become an exceptional dermatologist. This doesn't just happen by uh, sort of accident. Um, again, being one is not reimburse more, your reputations are just, this, these are all from Jack, and I agree with every one of these conclusions that he's got up here. So it's something that, you know, you have to work at and take advantage of, and you're going to do a great job. So I have every uh, confidence in everybody in this room that you're going to be fantastic, exceptional dermatologist, and you're going to get one more inspiration talk tomorrow, and then you're on your own. So, <laughs> thank you for coming, and uh, we'll let all that dramatic follow. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>